I've done everything there is in the game audio space, right? You know, I've done the music, I've done the technical sound design, I've done just the sound design, I've done a little bit of the production and planning, kind of a little bit of managing teams, and I wore all of the hats that there are there is to wear <laughs> in game audio. And I think that's one of the important qualities you, you, you need to have. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Game Logic Behind the Games. I am delighted to welcome Matthew Pablo onto the pod today. How are you, Matthew? Doing great. It's uh, early morning here in sunny Los Angeles. <laughs> Fantastic. What time is it over there? Uh, it's about eight o'clock. Right. So just woken up, just got out of bed of you. Well, actually, I, I start a little bit earlier because um, we're, uh, I work for a remote studio and we're all over the place um, in the U.S. So I, I would say about half of them are on the East Coast. So I'm kind of acclimated to their time zone. <laughs> Fair enough. Nice yeah, early yeah. start on a Monday. Uh, and I don't know how this has happened, but I always seem to now naturally start with a question about the weather, mainly because I moan about the London weather. But uh, how, how is it over in L.A.? I mean, it's it's kind of a rainy season, which lasts for about a month, month and a half or so, where it's raining, I mean, every other weekend or so. Like, we got some rain last week. Um, but, you know, LA is, like, pretty boring. It's sunny, not humid and warm, like, every day, so. Sounds all right to me. Sounds all right. <laughs> um, so, Matthew, uh, you are currently audio director at Other Side Entertainment. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind... Tell us a little bit about your journey, where you started out, how you got into the games industry, and how you've got to this point working as as uh, audio director over at other side. Yeah, it's actually. Uh, I think about it. I feel like I just started recently, but it's it's been probably ten plus years. Well, I got my start because uh, when I was a little kid, I I wanted to play, take piano lessons. Right, I asked my parents. I was like, please, I want to learn how to play this thing. Right. <laughs> And then at the same time, I was just really big into games. When I was growing up, I had a NES, a hand-me-down, and a Sega Genesis. I think at the time, Super Nintendo was a thing, but I wasn't really playing that because, you know, my parents were just like, oh, you have one, whatever, just go play it. And then I realized, wait a minute, what the heck is a PlayStation 1? I need one of those, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I got that, and then I was, like, really into, you know, Crash Bandicoot, Spyro, but I think it was Final Fantasy VII that really inspired me to, like, take my piano lessons to the next level and actually like learn how to make music because I was playing that game and I was like, how does this make me feel something? This is amazing. Like the music from Final Fantasy VII, right? So so, so it was the actual music in a game that made you decide that you wanted to go into gaming and that, that, that's what got you started playing piano and, and that's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, So so, what happened next? Yeah. So throughout my like, you know, middle school, high school, uh, career i was actually learning music composition from my piano teacher and it turned out that my piano teacher was like she was like an award-winning composer from the philippines right she was she she grew up in the philippines like older filipino lady and she uh whipped out all of these old orchestral scores and she's like i've won many competitions like you're like the only kid who's ever asked me about you know learning about music composition orchestration so she taught me a little bit about that so i was kind of learning you know, music theory, music composition, college level stuff when I was like in middle school. So when I was in middle school, I, you know, I couldn't, I didn't want to play, you know, any, I didn't want to play orchestral instruments. I wanted to like learn something kind of way out there. So I took up percussion. So when I was in high school, middle school, I did percussion. I did like, you know, professional marching band, indoor drum line. So that gave me some drumming chops. And then, you know, being like a rowdy teenager, I also like learned how to play guitar. So I learned how to play a little bit of everything. So by the time I got to college, I was like well equipped to do like film and video game music. So I, I went into a film music program at Berklee College of Music, and that w- that was like the only way to get into like media music, so video games. So I felt like that would give me like a stronger background. I'm, I set out to be like a game and film composer. Like, yeah, that's what that's what I set out to do. Um, so it wasn't until the end of my senior year at Berkeley College of Music, they opened up a video game music program. So I was pretty peeved about that. <laughs> but I mean, I still had, you know, the, the appropriate skills to, you know, work with a game team because I went out of my way to find small projects while I was in college. And a lot of those blossomed into, you know, those were student projects, you know, smaller indie groups. And eventually some of them went on to work for the industry. So that gave me a lot of like, deep connections to the gaming industry earlier on. 
So that's and how did you I maintain worked. your passion for the gaming industry through your education as well? You you continue yeah, playing I mean, games on. That was my ultimate goal, and yeah. you know I was you know keeping up with the latest and greatest consoles. I was up all you know pulling all nighters playing Call of Duty, Modern Warfare two <laughs> with my friends on Xbox. You know, <laughs> I mean I was I was really doing everything there was, and you know I like different kinds of music, and I also like different kinds of games. Like I'll play you know anything from you know Elder Scrolls all the way up to uh, I'm trying to think of another game that's just way out there, like like Harvest Moon type farming crafting games, right? <laughs> like I, I play a wide variety of everything. Um, maybe maybe not sports. I'm not. I wasn't really into big sports games. It it just seemed like early on it was like the subscription model that we all dread and fear these days, right? <laughs> yeah. So as a teenager, that was my go-to sports games. I used to, I used to love Pro Evo football, which is, uh, uh, an old Konami title, uh, or used to be called ISS as well, and a little bit of FIFA. But at the time, Pro Evo was what I played. Okay. As well as, as well as old Championship Manager, which is pretty big here in the UK, but not so much stateside. So it's funny yeah. you say, like, you played everything but sports. That well, was my I, I, main staple. Yeah. I think what it was is that, like, it, it just seemed too realistic to me. And it was kind right, of yeah, yeah. bland, right? But the yeah. game, the sports game that I did like was like NBA Jam and like NFL Blitz, like the games that made sports just like kind of game, like gamified, right? A little yeah. Bit. Well, it was funny because the only American sports games I used to play were the NHL games, just because you could you go play ice hockey and you fight. Uh, so, so I always used to play the <laughs> NHL games as well. They really appealed to me. Yeah. For some reason. Yeah. Probably I says think, more think- about me than anything. Yeah, and I think hockey was actually one of the games, uh, sports that I watched in person. You know, I grew up watching hockey. My family loved hockey, and all my friends liked it. And yeah, the fighting was definitely part of it. I remember, uh, what was it? Wayne Gretzky something for N64. And I just remember getting into a fight, just tapping B, just like punching the guy. (laughs) (laughs) Fun times. So, so you finished college, maintained that that passion for gaming, and you had obviously had some brilliant inspirations along the way, and then. Talk, talk to me about after college, how, you know, how did you get into that first job role post-education and where was yeah. that? What were you doing? And, and, and then what happened next? Yeah. So, you know, using that music experience, I was making all kinds of music. So my portfolio was like, you know, anything from, you know, sweeping orchestral lush music to like, you know, prog rock, heavy metal or like EDM, techno, whatever, you know. Because, you know, working on different games calls for different genres of music, right? So I really learned different styles, you know. Um, So basically, I was contracting for smaller games like mobile games. At the time, it was mostly the mobile market was booming, right? Mm -hmm. Um, There's many, many kinds of mobile games out there. And uh, I wasn't really like, you know, if you wanted to work on something AAA or something on console, you really had to join a big studio. So I wasn't really at that level yet. So I was just kind of just building my portfolio with these tracks, you know, licensing out different music tracks. And uh, eventually, you know, I just had more and more jobs. They kept getting better and better. It got from like crappier, you know, uh, rip off mobile games to something more legit. (laughs) Right. So some of those studios that were um, contacting me to do music were like bigger than, you know, bigger than just a guy just wanting to make something. They were like from actual companies. So I worked with Mm -hmm. this company out in the Bay area. They were called game closure and they had changed their names a couple of times. But they worked with major IPs like uh, Marvel, Disney, Pokemon, oh, okay. um, Walking Dead, and things like that. So having those like major IPs on my resume kind of like got other people interested. Like, oh, this guy's pretty legit. Maybe, you know, he could help us do some music. You know, I still contracted. And then I picked up a gig from uh, a game company in 2019 called Manticore Games. And they... You know, it, cons- it comprised of a lot of people from the industry. Um, like, there's folks in there who worked on The Sims. There's a lot of guys from EA, right? There was mm-hmm. a guy who, uh, I think he was one of the lead devs on uh, Dead, the original Dead Space, the, the Sim series. Um, there's some people who worked for, like, Telltale. And uh, I, I think it was just one guy. He's probably, if he's watching this, he'll probably know I'm talking about him. But, man, there's just talent from all over the games industry. We were coming together to build something. And my responsibility was building up music systems, sound design systems, game game audio systems. And and it's a funny story because my background is mostly music, right? And mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of people in game audio are mostly on the sound design technical side of things. And usually a composer is just going to be a composer working on different games. I mean, I've, I've done a little bit of everything in the industries thus far, 
but I'm really passionate about music. But the funny thing is, I don't think I would have gotten here if I didn't decide, like, maybe I should learn sound design, like proper sound design, proper game audio systems, technical design. And so, you know, alongside, you know, doing my audio con uh, music contracts, I was also learning, you know, different game engines, different audio middleware. So I kind of gained those skills in like technical sound design and regular sound design. And I think that's a really, really great lesson for anyone in the industry, right? And I think it's it obviously, uh, obviously quite prominent at the moment with, with, with layoffs and there's a lot of uh, literature around how you get into the industry, how to pick up jobs. But I think that's a, that's a great lesson that people can learn, right? To constantly be looking to upskill, constantly learning new skills, co constantly going on courses and, and, and arming yourself with as much knowledge as you can, right? Yeah. I mean, it was a big reality check when I was like, looking for it's like okay i've done all these small games i want to work you know full time or have like a, a really nice work and work in an industry job like at a big major studio and i found that every other place was not hiring for a composer they were hiring for audio technical design audio systems design you know technical sound designer there was nothing there related to music you know and i i talked to all of these recruiters and different you know hr people from different companies and i reached out you know and had these chats and they all told me, it's like, yeah, we just contract music. We'll just send something out. They'll deliver us a song, uh, you know, game theme, game loops, whatever. And then that's that. And then that was kind of the big reality check for me to like learn how that's really done. And I think a lot of times when, you know, when, when you're going to school, you'll think like, oh, okay, I'm just going to be really good at making this kind of music specifically, or like, you know, there maybe there's a big market for this or that. It's like, I think, I think there needs to be more programs that like you actually reach out to people in the industry and talk to them and see what it's really like. You know, there are internship programs and things like that. You know, they'll send you out to a recording studio. They'll send you out to a um, music production house. But it's like, it's not really real world, right? I think you, mm -hmm. if you want, you want to send these students out to like the job gigs that they want. Um, because I never got sent out to a, you know, a game studio or even like a film company. It was more like, here's a recording studio. Here's a composer's, you know, dedicated setup so it wasn't really like i think th at the time like the best way to do it so i kind of like learned the hard way you know <laughs> yeah yeah it, and again that's another interesting point because certainly i i think some other guests i've spoken to as well have alluded to the fact that they feel the gaming industry can be quite insular at times it can be quite inward looking and and sometimes there aren't those opportunities to go and spend some time at another studio or go go, go spend a a day with with somebody else with a with, with a different job title and and go and learn from each other. Uh, I think everyone kind of gets in their lane and and that that sharing of knowledge is quite it's quite difficult to to, to find people willing to share, right? Because it just doesn't seem to be the done thing. But it makes so much sense when you think about it. Yeah, I mean, I feel like you know going to music school and working in the field of uh, like music composition or audio production, it always. On the outside, it seems very competitive, but I think the community now these days are very open and willing to share. There was a yeah. time I felt like people weren't willing to share like their production trade secrets and how, how do they make this orchestral sounds or whatever. It's like, no, now people are all, you know, with content creation on the rise, that being a, a thing that people are really into, everyone's just putting everything out there. Everyone's learning from each other, and I think that's great. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if there's any positive to come from, from the awful recent news, uh, with, with, with mass layoffs. I hope that actually it does make the gaming community that much tighter and that much more caring and, and hopefully encourages some more of that knowledge sharing because, you know, there's a lot, look, there's a lot of people out there in this industry that are, that, that are trying to help each other. It's quite unique from that perspective. And, you know, yeah. hopefully we can, we can kind of prevent this happening again. But, uh, yeah, hopefully. Yeah, I, th I think we all <laughs> hope that. Um, cool. So coming on to your current role, Matthew, uh, currently yeah. now, uh, you've got yourself up to, to audio director at other side. Can you tell us a little bit more about day to day, what that job looks like and some of the things you actually do? Yeah. Um, let me think about that real quick. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm just like, I'm like wanting to go in specifics cause it's like fresh in my mind. Cause it's like, Oh, what I'm working on right now. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about, um, how I landed in that role actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe great. this might be a, a plug for you guys. Because it was you guys who reached out to me for this role, and I was very interested. And the thing is about getting into this job, um, I, at this point in time, I felt like I've done everything there is in the game audio space, right? You know, I've done the music, I've done the technical sound design, I've done just the sound design, I've done a little bit of the production and planning, kind of a little bit of managing teams. And 
I wore all of the hats that there are there is to wear <laughs> in game audio, and I think that's one of the important uh, qualities you, you you need to have as an audio producer or an audio director. Um, so when I had started, I actually felt like I was maybe a couple years ahead <laughs> going into the role. I was really surprised that they wanted me, but when I was uh, interviewing with them, you know, talking to Warren Spector and the CEO of the company, and you know some of the other developers there, it seemed like this is a place I want to be because not only can I kind of manage and shape the team and, you know, and the audio department at the company, but I could also be hands-on and do the stuff myself, which is something I'm really passionate about still, right? Mm -hmm. At least for now, right? I want to be hands-on. I want to be making stuff. You know, I've, I've done some sound design. I've done some music. I've done some engine um, development. um, And, you know, of course I'm doing a lot of the management and partnerships and planning and stuff for them. But I mean, Really, since we're a smaller studio, I think I'm doing a little bit of everything. <laughs> so my day-to-day really does look like I'm doing all there is when it comes to game audio. And some people might say, like, you know, that sucks and that is a lot. I mean, it can, right? But this is something that I want to do. And it's really, you know, my call that, hey, I want to I want to be part of this. I want to get in there and make some sounds, make it sound awesome. Yeah, um, I don't want to be the guy standing back, like, from far away telling everyone what to do, right? I really want to be part of it. And everyone at this company is really passionate about making something cool. And it it seems like, you know, one of our goals is to make great games that empowers players. Right. Um, And I really do feel like that's a, that's something that we're living. (laughs) That's awesome. What what a brilliant journey to get where you are. Fantastic story. Thank, thank you for sharing. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, Got a couple of questions left for you. I hope that's okay. Sure. Um, can I ask about your musical influences? What what you're currently playing? Are you still playing a little bit of everything? Are, are you are you, um, are you are you are you playing something more than than anything? You know what uh, what what's currently interesting you in the music scene? So lately, I've really been into a lot of these sort of virtuoso guitar prog rock groups like like Polyphia and Pliny. Um, I think uh, <laughs> you know I grew up listening to a lot of prog rock prog metal and you know just crazy Mm. metal music back in the day i was like really into rush as a young Uh (laughs) as a young guitar player that was very very ambitious right (laughs) uh their music was quite difficult but yeah polyphia is like really what i've been into as far as like prog rock goes but i'll say right now in like the recent months i've really been into like drum old school drum and bass right and and like yeah edm because i'm I'm working i've worked on so much music personal music for myself that i want to put out there i've worked on a lot of it the last two years and now i'm working on actually putting that stuff out and making content like about that oh that's so my yeah i released a single i think a week ago and it was like this edm trance hard uh tech house type of thing so i've been into that brilliant keeps you busy eh yeah, and there was a couple of months I was really into like old school like hip hop, like the golden golden age of hip hop, right? Like stuff from the '90s, late '80s. Um, Run DMC. Yeah, Look at that. there's a guy nice. uh, Damu the Fudge Monk. He does he plays jazz drums and he makes his own sampled like old school hip hop beats, and then people will scratch over it. And I've, I've been picking up like mixing with actual vinyl, so I have like turntables back here. And then I've been trying to put together a stream where I have like guitar and piano and I have a drum set over there, like all set up so I can do like this crazy, like stream with different instruments Wicked. working on it. But <laughs> that's yeah. cool, man. That's cool. So that's what I've been into lately. Yeah. <laughs> nice one. I, and I wanted to let you know as well, by the way, because um, obviously we met last year at GDC in San Fran. And when I, when I came over there, uh, I was training for an Ironman. So I was, I was doing these long runs and went past uh, Berkeley College a couple of times on, on my long runs and I needed to do an open water swim. So I kind of looked up where to go. We went to Berkeley Marina and there's a swim club there called Odyssey. And twice a week they swim in the bay. So I thought, great, you know, I'll, I'll do that. And I went, oh my God. I went first. Well, first of all, it was like, it was like the sea with, with these massive waves. It was windy. It was cold. Oh yeah, um, it's not. It's not calm over there. <laughs> it's not at all. And, and so you get in, and I think it's about it's about a mile there and back. So that you basically you swim straight out to a buoy, and then you come back. Mm-hmm. But I was quite an inexperienced swimmer in open water, anyway. So I kind of I, I was okay on the way there because the, the tide was coming in, and I could kind of see where I was going. But on the way back, I swam. Instead of coming straight back, I swam like r- really far out and the boat had to come and say, mate, get back that way. So anyway, I, I did it and, and, 
I enjoyed it. It was nice temperature, not not too cold. And I got out. And then I think it was even the night that we saw you, Matthew. I'd, I'd said to someone, oh, I went swimming in, in Berkeley Marina in, in, in the bay. I said, oh, you've got to watch out for sharks. I yep. said, what? I said, what? <laughs> They're kind of... <laughs> And I looked it up and it's like the fourth yeah. most shark infested stretch of water in the world. And there's little old me like swimming <laughs> miles out into the bay and I Google it. And, and like literally the year before, right? Um, to- tourists going over to Alcatraz saw a great white maul, uh, maul a seal in that, in that stretch of water. And I'm there in my wetsuit yeah. dressed like a seal. And I'm like, what? How do, <laughs> how do these people do that? So Berkeley Marina. Twice a week, they, those uh, maniacs, they go swimming in the sea there. And I went once and I'll, you know, never go back again. But that, that, <laughs> you say yeah. you went to Berkeley College. I always think oh, of yeah. that. Like, oh, God. Well, I have nightmares about it. Oh, my gosh. That's insane. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Never again. Ber- Berkeley, B E R K L E E, Berkeley yeah. College of Music. That's in Boston, Massachusetts. Oh, right. Sorry. So, yeah. no, no. different but place. We we have an ongoing joke at the school. There's this shirt that they sell where it's like crossed out the EY and then it's like spelled the correct <laughs> way because <laughs> people always mix mix that up. Oh, it was funny. Um, anyway, Matthew, before we go, I'd love to hear, if you don't mind, um, let me know what, what are you really looking forward to getting your hands on this year? What are you looking forward to playing? What's what's due for imminent release or, or release this oh my year? Gosh. That, uh, is that a long list? I think so, um, but I think one of the main things I'm really looking forward to is like the Star Wars, uh, what's it called? Star Wars Outlaws that Ubisoft uh-huh. is developing. I'm really excited to see if that's going to be worth my time. I I will probably play it. I'm a huge Star Wars fan, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I love oh, the nice. like the uh, Jedi Fallen Order series. That was great um, from Respawn. Um, what else was there? I really liked the. Uh, what Battlefront 2, you know, there's a lot of controversy coming out, but it actually turned into a really great game. Uh-huh. Um, uh, and when is Star Wars due for release, by the way? What's that? Do you, do you know when Star Wars due for release? That game or just yeah. in general? Yeah, Star, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the new Star I, Wars game. I think they were going to, I think they said they, it was slated for like late 23, so it might be like oh, okay. holiday or mid 24, something like that. Yeah. Um, huh. Look out for that. There's just going to be a lot of different Star Wars things. But I think, like, on top of my head, like, that's probably a big major release that I'm looking forward to. Oh, also the um, Final Fantasy VII uh, Rebirth or whatever. The the second one after the first remake. I don't know. It's so confusing with all the remasters and remakes. But it's a bit of nostalgia there for you. Yeah. That game, that game's going to be amazing. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Matthew, thank you so much for your time today. It's always a, an absolute pleasure catching up. I really enjoy our yeah. discussions. Uh, thank you for your time. Have a wonderful day in sunny LA. And I uh, <laughs> really hope to catch up with you soon. All right. Thank you.